Chapter thirty one of Jane Eyre. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter thirty one. My home, then, when I at last find a home, is a cottage, a little room with whitewashed walls and a sanded floor, containing four painted chairs and a table, a clock, a cupboard, with two or three plates and dishes, and a set of tea-things in Delph. Above, a chamber of the same dimensions as the kitchen, with a deal bedstead and chest of drawers, small, yet too large to be filled with my scanty wardrobe though the kindness of my gentle and generous friends has increased that, by a modest stock of such things as are necessary. It is evening. I have dismissed, with the fee of an orange, the little orphan who serves me as a handmaid. I am sitting alone on the hearth. This morning the village school opened. I had twenty scholars. But three of the number can read, none write or cipher. Several knit, and a few sew a little. They speak with the broadest accent of the district. At present they and I have a difficulty in understanding each other's language. Some of them are unmannered, rough, intractable, as well as ignorant. But others are docile, have a wish to learn, and evince a disposition that pleases me. I must not forget that these coarsely clad little peasants are of flesh and blood as good as the scions of gentlest genealogy and that the germs of native excellence, refinement, intelligence, kind feeling, are as likely to exist in their hearts as in those of the best-born. My duty will be to develop these germs. Surely I shall find some happiness in discharging that office. Much enjoyment I do not expect in the life opening before me. Yet it will, doubtless, if I regulate my mind, and exert my powers as I ought, yield me enough to live on from day to day. Was I very gleeful, settled, content, during the hours I passed in yonder bare, humble schoolroom this morning and afternoon? Not to deceive myself, I must reply, no. I felt desolate to a degree. I felt—yes, idiot that I am—I felt degraded. I doubted I had taken a step which sank instead of raising me in the scale of social existence. I was weakly dismayed at the ignorance, the poverty, the coarseness of all I heard and saw round me. But let me not hate and despise myself too much for these feelings. I know them to be wrong. That is a great step gained. I shall strive to overcome them. To-morrow, I trust, I shall get the better of them partially, and in a few weeks, perhaps, they will be quite subdued. In a few months, it is possible, the happiness of seeing progress and a change for the better in my scholars may substitute gratification for disgust. Meantime, let me ask myself one question. Which is better? To have surrendered to temptation, listened to passion, made no painful effort, no struggle, but to have sunk down in the silken snare, fallen asleep on the flowers covering it, wakened in a southern clime among the luxuries of a pleasure villa, to have been now living in France, Mr. Rochester's mistress, delirious with his love half my time, for he would, oh yes, he would have loved me well for a while. He did love me. No one will ever love me so again. I shall never more know the sweet homage given to beauty, youth, and grace, for never to any one else shall I seem to possess these charms. He was fond and proud of me. It is what no man besides will ever be. But where am I wandering, and what am I saying, and above all feeling? Whether it is better, I ask, to be a slave in a fool's paradise at Marseilles, fevered with delusive bliss one hour, suffocating with the bitterest tears of remorse and shame the next, or to be a village schoolmistress, free and honest, in a breezy mountain nook in the healthy heart of England? Yes. I feel now that I was right when I adhered to principle and law, and scorned and crushed the insane promptings of a frenzied moment. God directed me to a correct choice. I thank His providence for the guidance. 
Having brought my eventide musings to this point, I rose, went to my door, and looked at the sunset of the harvest day, and at the quiet fields before my cottage, which, with the school, was distant half a mile from the village. The birds were singing their last strains. The air was mild, the dew was balm. While I looked, I thought myself happy, and was surprised to find myself ere long weeping. And why? For the doom which had reft me from adhesion to my master. For him I was no more to see. For the desperate grief and fatal fury, consequences of my departure, which might now, perhaps, be dragging him from the path of right, too far to leave hope of ultimate restoration thither. At this thought I turned my face aside from the lovely sky of eve and lonely vale of Morton. I say lonely, for in that bend of it visible to me there was no building apparent save the church and the parsonage, half hidden trees, and quite at the extremity, the roof of Vale Hall, where the rich Mr. Oliver and his daughter lived. I hid my eyes, and leant my head against the stone frame of my door. But soon a slight noise near the wicket which shut in my tiny garden, from the meadow beyond it, made me look up. A dog, old Carlo, Mr. Rivers' pointer, as I saw in a moment, was pushing the gate with his nose, and St. John himself leant upon it with folded arms, his brow knit, his gaze, grave almost to displeasure, fixed on me. I asked him to come in. No, I cannot stay. I have only brought you a little parcel my sister's left for you. I think it contains a colour-box, pencils, and paper." I approached to take it. A welcome gift it was. He examined my face, I thought, with austerity as I came near. The traces of tears were doubtless very visible upon it. "'Have you found your first day's work harder than you expected?' he asked. "'Oh, no! On the contrary, I think in time I shall get on with my scholars very well. But perhaps your accommodations, your cottage, your furniture, have disappointed your expectations. They are in truth scanty enough, but—I interrupted. My cottage is clean and weather-proof, my furniture sufficient and commodious. All I see has made me thankful, not despondent. I am not absolutely such a fool and sensualist as to regret the absence of a carpet, a sofa, and silver plate. Besides, five weeks ago I had nothing. I was an outcast, a beggar, a vagrant. Now I have acquaintance, a home, a business. I wonder at the goodness of God, the generosity of my friends, the bounty of my lot. I do not repine. But you feel solitude and oppression. The little house there behind you is dark and empty. I have hardly had time yet to enjoy a sense of tranquillity, much less to grow impatient under one of loneliness. Very well. I hope you feel the content you express. At any rate, your good sense will tell you that it is too soon yet to yield to the vacillating fears of Lot's wife. What you had left before I saw you, of course, I do not know. But I counsel you to resist firmly every temptation which would incline you to look back. Pursue your present career steadily for some months at least." "'It is what I mean to do,' I answered. St. John continued, "'It is hard work to control the workings of inclination and turn the bent of nature, but that it may be done I know from experience. God has given us, in a measure, the power to make our own fate, and when our energies seem to demand a sustenance they cannot get, when our will strains after a path we may not follow, we need neither starve from inanition, nor stand still in despair. We have but to seek another nourishment for the mind, as strong as the forbidden food it longed to taste, and perhaps purer, and to hew out for the adventurous foot a road as direct and broad as the one fortune has blocked up against us, if rougher than it. A year ago I was myself intensely miserable, because I thought I had made a mistake in entering the ministry. Its uniform duties wearied me to death. I burned for the more active life of the world, for the more exciting toils of a literary career, for the destiny of an artist, author, orator, anything rather than that of a priest. Yes, the heart of a politician, of a soldier, of a votary of glory, a lover of renown, a lustre after power, beat under my curate's surplice. I considered. My life was so wretched, it must be changed, or I must die. After a season of darkness and struggling, Light broke, and relief fell. 
my cramped existence all at once spread out to a plain without bounds. My powers heard a call from heaven to rise, gather their full strength, spread their wings, and mount beyond ken. God had an errand for me, to bear which afar, to deliver it well, skill and strength, courage and eloquence, the best qualifications of soldier, statesman, and orator, were all needed, for these all centre in the good missionary. A missionary I resolved to be. From that moment my state of mind changed. The fetters dissolved and dropped from every faculty, leaving nothing of bondage but its galling soreness, which time only can heal. My father indeed imposed the determination, but since his death I have not a legitimate obstacle to contend with. Some affairs settled, a successor for Morton provided, an entanglement or two of the feelings broken through or cut asunder, a last conflict with human weakness, in which I know I shall overcome, because I have vowed that I will overcome and I leave Europe for the East." He said this in his peculiar, subdued, yet emphatic voice, looking when he had ceased speaking not at me, but at the setting sun, at which I looked too. Both he and I had our backs towards the path leading up the field to the wicket. We had heard no step on that grass-grown track. The water running in the vale was the one lulling sound of the hour and scene. We might well then start when a gay voice, sweet as a silver bell, exclaimed, "'Good evening, Mr. Rivers! And good evening, old Carlo! Your dog is quicker to recognise his friends than you are, sir. He pricked his ears and wagged his tail when I was at the bottom of the field, and you have your back towards me now.' It was true. Though Mr. Rivers had started at the first of those musical accents, as if a thunderbolt had split a cloud over his head, he stood yet, at the close of the sentence, in the same attitude in which the speaker had surprised him, his arm resting on the gate, his face directed towards the west. He turned at last with measured deliberation. A vision, as it seemed to me, had risen at his side. There appeared, within three feet of him, a form clad in pure white, a youthful, graceful form, full yet fine in contour and when, after bending to caress Carlo, it lifted up its head and threw back a long veil, there bloomed under his glance a face of perfect beauty. Perfect beauty is a strong expression, but I do not retrace or qualify it. As sweet features as ever the temperate clime of Albion moulded, as pure hues of rose and lily as ever her humid gales and vapoury skies generated and screened, justified, in this instance, the term. No charm was wanting, no defect was perceptible. The young girl had regular and delicate lineaments, eyes shaped and coloured as we see them in lovely pictures, large and dark and full. The long and shadowy eyelash which encircles a fine eye, with so soft a fascination, the pencilled brow which gives such clearness, the white smooth forehead, which adds such repose to the livelier beauties of tint and ray the cheek oval, fresh and smooth, the lips fresh too, ruddy, healthy, sweetly formed, the even and gleaming teeth without flaw, the small dimpled chin, the ornament of rich, plenteous tresses, all advantages, in short, which combined, realised the ideal of beauty, were fully hers. I wondered, as I looked at this fair creature, I admired her with my whole heart. Nature had surely formed her in a partial mood, and forgetting her usual stinted stepmother dole of gifts, had endowed this, her darling, with a grand dame's bounty. What did St. John Rivers think of this earthly angel? I naturally asked myself that question as I saw him turn to her, and look at her, and as naturally I sought the answer to the inquiry in his countenance. He had already withdrawn his eye from the peri, and was looking at a humble tuft of daisies which grew by the wicket. "'A lovely evening, but late for you to be out alone,' he said, as he crushed the snowy heads of the closed flowers with his foot. "'Oh, I only came home from S.' She mentioned the name of a large town some twenty miles distant. "'This afternoon. Papa told me you had opened your school, and that the new mistress was come and so I put on my bonnet after tea, and ran up the valley to see her. This is she," pointing to me. "'It is,' said St. John. "'Do you think you shall like Morton?' she asked of me, with a direct and naive simplicity of tone and manner, pleasing, if childlike. "'I hope I shall. I have many inducements to do so.' 
Did you find your scholars as attentive as you expected? Quite. Do you like your house? Very much. Have I furnished it nicely? Very nicely, indeed. And made a good choice of an attendant for you in Alice Wood? You have, indeed. She is teachable and handy. This, then, I thought, is Miss Oliver, the heiress, favoured, it seems, in the gifts of fortune as well as in those of nature. What happy combination of the planets presided over her birth, I wonder! I shall come up and help you to teach sometimes," she added. It will be a change for me to visit you now and then, and I like a change. Mr. Rivers, I have been so gay during my stay at S. Last night, or rather this morning, I was dancing till two o'clock. The Blankth Regiment are stationed there since the riots, and the officers are the most agreeable men in the world. They put all our young knife-grinders and scissor-merchants to shame." It seemed to me that Mr. St. John's under-lip protruded, and his upper lip curled a moment. His mouth certainly looked a good deal compressed, and the lower part of his face unusually stern and square, as the laughing girl gave him this information. He lifted his gaze, too, from the daisies, and turned it on her. An unsmiling, a searching, a meaning gaze it was. She answered it with a second laugh, and laughter well became her youth, her roses, her dimples, her bright eyes. As he stood, mute and grave, she again fell to caressing Carlo. "'Poor Carlo loves me,' said she. "'He is not stern and distant to his friends, and if he could speak, he would not be silent.' As she patted the dog's head, bending with native grace before his young and austere master, I saw a glow rise to that master's face. I saw his solemn eye melt with sudden fire, and flicker with resistless emotion. Flushed and kindled thus, he looked nearly as beautiful for a man as she for a woman. His chest heaved once, as if his large heart, weary of despotic constriction, had expanded, despite the will, and made a vigorous bound for the attainment of liberty. But he curbed it, I think, as a resolute rider would curb a rearing steed. He responded neither by word nor movement to the gentle advances made him. "'Papa says you never come to see us now,' continued Miss Oliver, looking up. "'You are quite a stranger at Vale Hall. He is alone this evening, and not very well. Will you return with me and visit him?' "'It is not a seasonable hour to intrude on Mr. Oliver,' answered St. John. "'Not a seasonable hour! But I declare it is. It is just the hour when papa most wants company, when the works are closed and he has no business to occupy him. Now, Mr. Rivers, do come. Why are you so very shy and so very sombre?" She filled up the hiatus his silence left by a reply of her own. "'I forgot,' she exclaimed, shaking her beautiful curled head as if shocked at herself. "'I am so giddy and thoughtless. Do excuse me. It had slipped my memory that you have good reasons to be indisposed for joining in my chatter. Diana and Mary have left you, and Morehouse is shut up, and you are so lonely. I am sure I pity you. Do come and see papa." "'Not to-night, Miss Rosamond, not to-night.' Mr. St. John spoke almost like an automaton, himself only knew the effort it cost him thus to refuse. "'Well, if you are so obstinate, I will leave you, for I dare not stay any longer. The dew begins to fall. Good evening.' She held out her hand. He just touched it. "'Good evening,' he repeated, in a voice low and hollow as an echo. She turned, but in a moment returned. "'Are you well?' she asked. Well might she put the question. His face was as blanched as her gown. "'Quite well,' he enunciated. And with a bow he left the gate. She went one way, he another. She turned twice to gaze after him as she tripped fairy-like down the field. He, as he strode firmly across, never turned at all. This spectacle of another's suffering and sacrifice wrapped my thoughts from exclusive meditation on my own. Diana Rivers had designated her brother, inexorable as death. She had not exaggerated. End of chapter 31